Welcome to Inside Story, the only show about life on the inside by people who lived it. I'm Lawrence Bartley. Free World Bye! So how did you get access to tampons, pads, or cups in prison? Ooh, shit. When you're incarcerated, it really feels like the world has forgotten about you. I was incarcerated from 16 to the time I was 24. And in that moment, I decided to become a poet. Most people never know what it's like to be incarcerated and trust, that's a good thing. But it turns out there's a pretty easy way to gain an understanding of life on the inside without ever having to go. Free World Vibes, okay? Okay. okay. One. You recording? Yeah, yeah, I'm already recording. Two, three, Free World Vibes! Straight up. This probably looks like yet another group of influencers making videos for social media. And well, it is. But these TikTokers have come up to rural Pennsylvania for the weekend to make a very specific type of content. Hey y'all, so I am with a bunch of my prison friends. I'm so excited. They were in prisons that did not cook with a blow dryer. And I'm a Texas girl and that's how we cook. So I've got to represent, right? So I am making stuffed jalapenos. I'm gonna bread these suckers and fry them up with my blow dryer for y'all. I put our peppers in the pillowcase. I feel like the more brutal the conditions under prison, the more creative you become. For sure. Between everyone here, you're looking at several million followers. And they're not just big on TikTok. This guy even managed to get himself on the local news after he helped sponsor a neighborhood baseball team. I get stopped a lot for pictures and stuff like that. And like, I'm not one of these, I'm just a dude. I'm just a dude with a criminal record that happened to get lucky on social media. And as luck would have it, Ray stumbled sure. upon a way of using that popularity. How's that feel to see that people are talking about you off of TikTok? That's awesome. That's awesome because like, they're not like, oh, he makes prison content, he does this. They're like, he's giving back. Everyone gathered here has been through the prison system. And they're all mostly known in a subgenre of TikTok content that some people call prison talk. At first, a lot of this stuff was actually filmed inside prison. Ooh, shit! With incarcerated people using contraband phones and making videos inside cells. I never shot heroin until I went to prison because I'd But increasingly, people who've served time and are now on the outside are using TikTok to share their past experiences on the inside. So when I got out of prison, I paroled to like the middle of fucking nowhere. I was in the country, I didn't have a car, I didn't know anybody. So I went from being around all of these people all the time to being like basically alone. Carrie Blakinger is one of those creators. She spent almost two years in prison for drug possession. After getting out, she became a journalist. And she was one of the organizers of this get together. For me, the thing that I was really looking forward to was being able to just spend time with a bunch of people who have done time and understand that experience, and also um, who have platforms and are on social media and understand that experience. And to have this, you know, sort of Venn diagram of people who understand both is just really refreshing. I mean, that's a really narrow Venn diagram. It is. It's us. We're here. <laughs> Look, let's be real. Let's talk about who's here. Yeah. Today, it's a lot of white folks. From what I can tell, a lot of the biggest accounts that talk about prison, a lot of white folks, that doesn't look like the actual populations right. who are doing time, black and brown people. I think there's a few reasons for that. You know, because of white privilege, I think that white people are more often able to take the risk of being very public about having done time. And I think a lot of black and brown people may not really be able to afford to do that. DC jail is rough. Yeah, that's rough. called, they call it gladiator school. Yeah. And that's a legit thing. It's a stabbing every three hours. Dontrell Britton has only been on TikTok for about a year. TikTok is something he likes doing, but he's not exactly making a living off of it. Instead, he splits his time between running a vegan food truck and being a personal trainer. It was literally one in the morning, I'm in DC hanging out with friends. And then Colin, who I know from like TikTok, he's like, yo, I know this about to sound crazy. <laughs> he said, 
<laughs> he said, you're the only like black content creator I know that's been in prison. If you can make it, come down. And I was like, all right, I'll come. So yeah, that's how I got here. Who are the people you want to speak to? For me, it, it's connecting with people who come from uh, circumstances like myself. That 16-year-old kid who, who's battling, like, should I sell drugs or should I stay in school? I got young guys from my neighborhood who literally watch me go to jail, come out, and make a following on TikTok. And so now when they see me, it's like, damn, bro, hey, like, put me on your Instagram, put me on Instagram. Okay, so how did you get access to tampons, pads, or cups in prison? Yeah, so I went to one county jail that just didn't have tampons. They weren't even for sale. All that you had was uh, the pads, and so people would roll their own tampons, and then they would always try to seize and confiscate those. In Texas, um, we got six tampons a month and one 24-pack <laughs> a... Uh, yeah, that's it. Even if everyone has a common background, their TikToks are all pretty different. Okay, so here are the last words of executed death row prisoner James Colburn. I just Some make videos that are informational. Some mostly make funny videos. I got all of my tattoos in prison, and as they say, you get what you pay for. And a lot of them have a mixture of both. Welcome to part one of me illustrating my prison stories. With and not everyone here agrees on the best way to represent the experience of going through prison, which maybe isn't surprising because they've all had different experiences. But for Carrie, those differences don't matter as much as what she hopes people take away from what this group is making. I think I want people to understand what prisons and prison conditions are actually like and why that should matter. Why should it matter? I think that a lot of times people think about prisons in terms of balancing um, rehabilitation and punishment. I get a lot of comments from people about like, don't do the crime if you can't do the time. And when I get those comments, I respond to them and I explain like, okay, if that's the view you take, then prisons are going to continue to make society less safe. You need to treat people some basic level of dignity and you need to care about prison conditions if you want prisons to do what you say you want them to do. <laughs> Wait, one more, come on. Billions of dollars given to state and local governments from the $350 billion COVID relief package went straight to the criminal justice system, according to a Marshall Project analysis. Some examples of where it went? New guns, armored vehicles, training facilities, and bonuses for police and correctional officers. Some Colorado prison inmates say they're being used as, in their words, slave labor. Last year, Colorado enacted a minimum wage for some prisoners, and other states are considering similar bills. The push to pay incarcerated workers ignited when they were forced to work at the height of the pandemic and got less than a dollar an hour for it, if anything at all. Incarcerated workers produce more than $11 billion in goods and services a year. Several states deploy incarcerated workers to fight wildfires, and the trend's growing as blazes get more frequent and intense. We went to every fire station. They told me I was going to never be a fireman. We just want a chance to prove to society that we can be great people. In California, lawmakers created a path for these firefighters to go pro once they get out. But in other states, most former prisoners still can't get a job in the profession they trained and risked their lives in while they were incarcerated. The hit series Orange is the New Black ran for seven seasons on Netflix after its debut in 2013, portraying a group of women who did time together. It was based on a novel by Piper Kerman who did time herself. She sat down with me to talk about the writing process as well as what's going on in America's prisons. What does the title mean? Orange is the New Black. So the title is uh, perhaps obviously sort of a satirical joke about the legendary, notorious orange jumpsuit that we associate with incarcerated people. Mm -hmm. um, and sort of a, a snide joke, if you will, the idea that that could ever fit into a fashion cliche. It also refers to the fact that women have been the fastest growing part of the incarcerated population for decades now, right? The rate of incarceration for women has exceeded the rate of incarceration for men during mass incarceration. Mm -hmm. And it continues to rise. So the person wearing that orange jumpsuit is more likely than ever to be a woman. 
Did you begin writing that book while you were incarcerated? I did not. I was incarcerated uh, in the federal system, and I was incarcerated from 2004 to 2005. So I served 13 months of a 15-month sentence, really a mercifully short sentence, which I was serving for a crime I had committed 10 years prior, first-time drug offense. Like most incarcerated people, I was sort of focused on questions of survival and also sort of navigating that community that you're part of, which is a really unique and interesting community of women that is found in a, in a correctional facility. But what I was doing when I was incarcerated was writing a lot of letters to my people on the outside. I was really, really fortunate to receive mail from people who were on the outs and who, who cared about me. And you know, if you get a letter in prison, you write somebody back. That's you know, a fact. like a letter is like gold. Mail call was one of the most important times of day. So, but those letters to the outside sort of served the same purpose as the book, which was trying to explain what I was experiencing and what I was witnessing to people who are on the outside who maybe had never set foot in a prisoner or jail. Can you tell me your intentions for the book? Was it represented appropriately in the series? You know, any book could not inform seven seasons of television. So there's lots of um, departures from the true story that's told in the book. There's lots of new characters. What I care about so much and what makes me really happy about the series is that the themes from the book, which are themes of race and class and gender and power and friendship and empathy, those themes are in every single episode of the show, every single season, and that's what is important to me because those are the themes that I want people to think about when they think about mass incarceration and when they think about what's really happening to people behind the walls. It's your memoir, but some of the characters came from real life people. Has any of those folks in the book ever reached out to you about compensation? They have not. I mean, I am in touch with a lot of people who are, who are women I did time with. And of course, I think about those questions of equity and fairness. So what I try to do is to donate some of the money that I earn um, to organizations that work to fight mass incarceration in some way, but what I prioritize is organizations that are led by formerly incarcerated people. Have you ever gone back into a prison to visit? Oh, I go into prisons and jails whenever I am invited and able to go. I just remember when you're incarcerated, it really feels sometimes like the world has forgotten about you. And I think it's so important to go into prisons and jails and to be like, I care about your situation. I care about the conditions in which you are trying to survive. I care about you coming home successfully. And I think it's really, you know, it's really important to do that. Yeah. I, I think it's important for everyone to do that. My name is Reginald Dwayne Betts. I was incarcerated for eight and a half years for carjacking from the time I was 16 to the time I was 24. Yeah, we're gonna get some new nomenclature. Well, we bring it to life when we add books on exactly. it, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Somebody asked me, what would I do if I, if I had no limits? I'm a lawyer. I've worked to represent friends of mine. I get that. But I felt like books have radically changed my life. And that books are often the one thing that's missing from the story. And so I thought we put millions of people in prison. And there's a lot of people who don't have dignity in prison. I think books are a dignity-affirming instrument. And so I thought to myself, what if we put millions of books into prisons because we put millions of people in there? This is like a 4,000 square foot like warehouse, but we able to produce easily two, three, 4,000 libraries a year out of this space. 
The way we think about penitentiaries and prisons right now, I mean, the way they function in society is, is as a vehicle to make people less proximate to those who they feel have caused folks harm, have caused folks suffering. And so I think about Freedom Reads as a, as, a, as a project that's around proximity. And through proximity, I think you deepen your moral understanding in both directions. And we were just talking about racial Oh, we, that's what I was looking for, the Fanon. Yeah, yeah I, told, I told Claude we had Fanon. So the, the, and the first one we did was at um, MCI Norfolk, which is um, the prison where Malcolm X was incarcerated. And what was dope about that is we built it in November 2021. We installed it, they gutted a prison cell. We put it inside of a prison cell. We came back for the official opening, it was on December 9th, 2021. And that is the first morning, it's about 25 years to the day, the first morning that I woke up in prison because I got locked up on December 8th, 1996. Woke up on December 9th, came back in 25 years later, talking about books. When I was 16 years old and I was, I was in solitary confinement and books were contraband in a hole. And these guys had set up an underground library and the, the only rule was if you called out for a book, somebody had one, they would send it to you. They didn't need to know your name, just the cell you were in. That was, that, that story right there, me getting that book, it was The Black Poets by Dudley Randall. Changed my life forever, 16 years old, and in that minute, I decided, in that moment, I decided to become a poet. You could change the trajectory of your entire life uh, based on something that you read in a book. And that really is the, the origin of Freedom Reads. People tell me all of the time, they ask me, what do you think you would have been if not, had you not gone to prison? Uh, they recognize that, that prison has given me these things that it seems like I wouldn't have gotten otherwise. And, and I agree. I was not considering being a poet. Uh, I was not considering being an attorney. But when the judge told me I am under no illusion that sending you to prison will help you, that became the catalyst for everything that followed. Because I was committed to saying that something is very perverse when you live in a society and they say that it's, this is not going to help you. So I did eight and a half years in prison and all I was wearing was concrete and steel and plastic. I never got to, to see a tree, let alone to see, to see wood where I, where I lived. And so we make our libraries out of maple, out of oak, out of walnut. I remember when, uh, when Troy said that in, when he was making these in Louisiana, he, Troy is one of our fabricators in Louisiana that built the modules, the libraries that we put in Angola. He came back into Angola like 90 days after he had been locked up there. And he was touching the wood and was like, I'm telling you, you could discover an ocean inside of this. And for people accustomed to just looking at concrete walls, I mean, this is like fantastic. Freedom Reads has been a project for people on the inside. And, and maybe just as significantly, Freedom Reads is a, is a way for people on the outside to express our kinship our support and our belief in the possibilities of those on the inside. Basic things like soap or books are hard to come by in any jail or prison, but things are even worse for people inside isolation. Matthew Azano spent two years in prison in upstate New York where he learned how surviving in the box often means thinking outside of it. Any prisoner can tell you that a peculiar economy exists behind bars. Items like cigarettes are currency in transactions for everything, from food to toilet paper. Goods are in short supply, especially for those in solitary confinement. While serving two years for burglary, I reported on how people in New York's so-called special housing units, or SHU, buy and sell their goods. To understand how the economy works in what we call the box, you have to know how the units are laid out. In New York prisons, most solitary prisoners live in massive cell blocks, separate from the general population. There can be 200 cells stacked multiple tiers high, each rarely larger than six by eight feet. Each cell often holds two men. For months, even years, people in the box are confined for 23 or 24 hours a day. Viewing the shoe from the outside, you don't see the cells themselves, but rather the attached recreation pen. Rec time is a clamorous affair. When the doors unlock, prisoners walk out. As men shout to each other from one side to the other, some guys are having conversations, others scream obscenities and threats. Amid the cacophony, people call out what they're trying to sell or buy, enlisting intermediaries to better communicate. 
commissary is extremely limited and solitary. Only after many months of good behavior may a shoe prisoner get the privilege to buy food. Although it's just small snacks, for the vast majority, their only purchases are hygiene products and stamps, a major currency because everybody needs them. Whatever you're buying or selling, you must learn how to fish. Fishing lines are made of ripped strips of sheets, towels, and clothes. With thin enough strips, you can make about 100 feet of line out of a single bed sheet. To fish, you attach the item you're selling to the line along with a weight, such as a bar of soap or a 20-year-old magazine. When you toss the line towards your buyer, the weight creates momentum needed to carry your item through the air and drag it towards the right cell after it lands. Of course, commodities can fall off the line or land in places where they can't be recovered. Arguments can ignite over accusations of theft, so you need to know who you can trust to pass on your goods. But the limitations make prisoners' proficiency all the more fascinating. One man told me about a guy in the third tier who could shoot a line so accurately that the item slid underneath his target's door more than 100 feet away. Human survival has always depended on our ability to cooperate creatively. You literally have to think outside the box. In this episode, we met a handful of people trying to show the outside world what life is like on the inside. These creators can't always tell the whole story of prison life, but they offer the public an important glimpse. But what gets lost when the reality of prison life gets touched by Hollywood or social media? Sitcoms make us laugh, but will people tune in for a show about the painful reality of daily life in a cell? Or the day-to-day -day experience of being a correctional officer, especially a female one? Either way, social media is putting control back into the hands of people impacted by the system. And that's what we hope to do here as well, to show the world what prisons and the people inside them are really like, and to remind folks that everyone involved in a system doesn't have to be the subject of other people's stories. Instead, they can be the inventors of their own. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.